Good evening. Well, of course, big developments in Johannesburg today where the historian Francis Fukuyama, one of the world's most best-known public intellectuals, has currently been speaking at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. We cross now live to my colleague, the SABC News reporter, Nompu Siziba. She's there for us now. Nompu, good evening to you. Francis Fukuyama, the author of books like The End of History, The Origins of Political Order, Political Decay, his latest works about identity. What's he been focusing on there? Thanks very much, uh, um, uh, Stephen. Uh, well, basically, um, he was touching a myriad of issues. He gave us a little bit of a political economy history. Uh, you know what happened in terms of um, what happened. You know from the world wars and how Europe came together, the Washington Consensus, uh, and all of these things. Laissez-faire. Uh, Margaret Thatcher coming into power in the UK. Uh, President Reagan in the United States, and their philosophy about you know the economics of the world uh, and there was this view that you know the markets uh, can do everything can solve all of uh, the economies or society's problems but one of the things that he said was that um, the state is pivotal I mean that was the crux of his message basically saying that if you don't have a competent um, and uh, ethical leader uh, state uh, then you're going to your prospects of growth and development are going to be very uh, hampered indeed and uh, he, he went through various case studies uh, of countries that have succeeded and countries that haven't. He, he did cite quite a lot about the Southeast Asian uh, economies which basically had nothing um, but found a way uh, in terms of pursuing policies and sticking to them. He talked about how the people trusted their leaders and because of that trust people were able to adhere to the economic policies of the day and hence you get the successes like Japan Japan, Taiwan, even China, of course their uh, political philosophy or political um, philosophy is different because they're not necessarily a democracy, but he did cite China for example. With me here I do have Ern B uh, Bernstein, she's the executive director uh, of the Center of Development and Enterprise and they are actually the uh, guys who are hosting um, Mr. Fukuyama, Fukuyama and uh, uh, I, I, we're going to just have a chat with her to just basically uh, get a sense of of what he was saying and what lessons can be drawn from his message around the South African economy where we know we've had uh, issues around state capture and so on. So our state has not really been doing what it's supposed to do in order for our economy to get going. Thanks very much for joining us, Anne. Um, so you had a very great turnout. Um, I mean, everyone was just, it was, the place was full. It was uh, open, bursting at the seams, may I say. Um, what did you draw from the professor's message to us focusing on the importance of the state in a development a developmental state well I think that we've had a fantastic week we've taken him all over Johannesburg from business to the, the presidency and tomorrow the Reserve Bank and the senior government officials I think this is a an academic analysis and a very deep one uh, raising a lot of big issues. South Africa today doesn't have an effective state at all. It's corrupt, incoherent and incompetent in large measure. And the key message of this talk this evening was if you want an effective market-driven economy you have to also have a smart capable state that is not corrupt. Not perfect, but not corrupt. And that's hard to achieve. But South Africa is going to have to mobilize, and South Africans are going to have to mobilize around reform in order to get a more effective state, which is so vital if we're going to create the kind of society that really improves millions of people's lives. Now I know that the CDE has been really advocating um, re-industrialization and talking about um, boosting areas like the textiles industry and so on and so forth. Uh, when, Ms. when Professor Fukuyama talks about if you have a corrupt state then don't even think about uh, industrialization or an industrial policy. 
how does that then fit with uh, what you're saying about how you view the state currently and growing the economy and doing things like industrializing the economy? Well, South Africa's in a bind. On the one hand, we have to grow, and we have to grow in a much more labor-intensive way, and we don't need a perfect state to do that. We also have a decentralized system, so some cities are more effective than others. Some provinces have more capacity than others, so it's not everything in South Africa is not working. So what we've been saying is that you have to create jobs for the workforce we actually have, which unfortunately is not a highly skilled workforce. And what they've done in the success stories of Asia, and now some African countries are doing this as well, is they're attracting light manufacturing, the people who make your and my t-shirts, and maybe a men's shirt, and assemble toys, and assemble electronic goods. Uh, and this can create lots and lots and lots of jobs for people who have had no experience of work before and with very, you know, not great education. And South Africa has to move in that direction if we're going to turn the dial on our 10 million people who are unemployed. So that's the one issue that's really important. The other is we have to simultaneously put some people in jail who are crooks. And however powerful they are, however close they are to the political elite, however important they are in the ANC or the cabinet or other structures, if they need to be charged and then if found guilty, they need to go to jail. We still do not have anybody in jail from state capture. So we have to start recreating a different kind of state that is much more professional and that is merit-based as much as possible. We need people who are competent to actually generate power, otherwise we won't have electricity. So we've, the chickens have come home to roost. I don't think the professor is saying you have to have a perfect state tomorrow and that you have to wait for growth in order to do that. What he is saying is that unlike libertarians who, or people who want to have less and less and less of the state involved in society, the truth is in a developing country, you need an effective state. But what he's also saying is that if you have a weak state, which is what we have, you must start at the, the one end of his axis, which is do the basic functions well. If you can get the electricity going, the water, the policing, start with those things. That would be a very big contribution and get basic infrastructure going. There's so many places where that's falling apart in South Africa. So you've got to start there and stop all these dreams about a state bank. And in, you, you need to be realistic about what we can do. So we don't have to be perfect and you can do two things at the same time. We have to get growth going and that will involve much, giving much greater head to the private sector. But not alone, you need to get the state going so they can also regulate this. But and one of the realities that does face us, you talked about how we can resolve the situation of many people being left on the unemployment heap and some of the industries that we could create for them to be included uh, in the economy. But then, on the other hand, we do have the fourth industrial rev revolution. And Professor Fukuyama did actually concede that Americans, even in the, one of the most developed countries in the world, are concerned about what that means for them in terms of jobs. There is this realization that as these digital technologies come, they are going to take people's jobs. So on the, uh, on the extreme spectrum where people are already advanced, they're worried and we're still thinking about almost regressing and doing the basic stuff. So how do we, how do we you know, deal with that difficulty? So I think South Africans should stop talking so glibly about the fourth industrial revolution, which is never defined, and start thinking much more practically. Of course, machines are going to take over various kinds of activities and they're already doing that but that doesn't mean it's happening in the textile industry which it isn't it's happening in the automobile industry which we subsidize at great expense but it is not happening in the textile industry and if you talk to experts all over the world there are 10 to 15 years more in man light manufacturing if you like for low-skilled people of the kind that I've described that we should go and get 
and this is not yet mechanizing. So on the one hand, you have to say, let's get the jobs we can now for the population we actually have. Secondly, you have to say, stop talking about the fourth industrial revolution. Let's fix basic education. And that will be a political act. You have to say you cannot run this massive education system where for the vast majority of people, most of whom are poor, we provide a terrible education. And you can't run that system without performance management. So teachers don't come to work on a Monday or a Friday. And if they do come, they often don't teach for very many hours. Well, if I did that, I would be fired. And if you did that, you would be fired. But we don't do that in education or health. So we have to fix our education system because... The, something like 75% of young South Africans in grade three or four can't read for meaning. So I don't want to talk about the fourth industrial revolution when people can't read or add up. We, so we need to be realistic. We, we must stop believing all the hype. This is a real phenomenon. I'm not saying it's not happening. And I, but I'm saying the most important thing we can do is get the sort of industries where we can get people into work, young people, particularly women, disproportionately women, who have no other options, get them into work as quickly as possible. At the same time, put real political energy and effort into fixing our basic education system. We have 8 million young people aged 15 to 34 who are not in employment, training or education. So let's fix those issues as fast as we can, but effectively. And at the same time, let's also think about the developments that, that are taking place. But I don't want to talk about the fourth industrial revolution endlessly, when I think most people are not very clear on what they're talking about. But we don't want to talk about reform in basic schooling. Okay, no, and you've made your point, and I think it's fair enough. I do understand what you're saying. We're going to leave it there. Thank you very much for hosting this evening uh, and for introducing us to Professor Fukuyama. Uh, that was uh, Anne Bernstein. She's the Executive Director of uh, the Centre for Development and Enterprise. Uh, I'm going to just shunt her away and bring in uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Adam Habib. He's the Vice-Chancellor of its University, um, and obviously he's the one who uh, provided the facilities uh, for this event to take place. Professor, what did you take away from Professor Fukuyama's uh, uh, comments and uh, observations around the political economy? So, you know, what, what, he, what he seemed to me, the primary lesson was that politics is important. And politics is important and we've got to think about what that means. And I think if there's a single lesson we learned from today, uh, and from Professor Fukuyama, Fukuyama's lecture, it's that getting an appropriate state, a well-capacitated state, and public officials that act with integrity is paramount. You can't think about growth, you can't think about inclusion without getting a state that works. And frankly, one of our biggest problems is our state institutions don't work. If you go to local government, you go to state-owned enterprises, you go to many, many institutions, they just don't work. And if we want to start dealing and healing the problems of South Africa, then we've got to start getting state capacity right. And that means taking skills in, uh, seriously and making sure we appoint the right officials in our institutions. Aren't we beginning to do that? We're seeing, you know, some capacity put in in terms of leadership at SARS uh, and other institutions. We've got the state capture inquiry, which hopefully won't just be, you know, a question and answer situation and people will be, br be brought to book at the end of it. I think we're starting to do that. Uh, I think we forget that the rot is deep and that we've got a l much further to go. So yes, I, I'm optimistic at what has happened in SARS. I'm seeing what's happening in the, in the state capture uh, hearings and, and all of this is coming out. I think it's important. But I do start think that we need to start fixing this problem at the very cold face of where service delivery happens. We need to start fixing it at local government level. We need to start fixing it at state-owned enterprises level. We definitely need to fix it at places like ESCOM or SAA or where the water provisions are and all of those institutions as much as we fix it at the national institute. So SARS is great. 
Treasury is important. But let's fix it at the very coal face of development, which is local government and where actually services are provided to the nation itself. One of the things we keep on hearing, you know, across social media and so on is that people make the comment that, you know, the ANC government has been in power for so long and some of the mistakes that have arisen are directly due to their actions and so on. So how can they be trusted to fix the very things that they broke in the first place? Do you think perhaps we'll do better with coalition politics? Well, I think that I worry about coalition politics. I know that many of the opposition parties love the idea of coalition politics, but coalition politics at the very, very heart of it is an instability. It depends who is coming together. What we saw in coalition politics is the DA and the EFF coming together. And did you see coherence at local government level? In fact, what you saw is increasing instability in those in, in those contexts. Look at what happened in Nelson Mandela. Look at what happened in Swade. So I worry about that kind of coalition politics. I think we mustn't start looking for easy answers. I think what we need to start taking seriously is how to make the state accountable. How to make sure that officials are accountable. How to make sure that if people are corrupt that they will be there will be action against them. And I don't think that applies to the ANC. I think it applies to the DA. It applies to the EFF. We've seen the saga about VBS and how many political parties were impacted on it. I think we need to hold all of them accountable. Ultimately, we must remember that politicians don't deliver because they're good people. They deliver because they get kicked out of office if they don't deliver. And I think all of us need to start thinking about how we make all politicians accountable to the citizens themselves. Professor, we've been having an energy focus at the SABC today and one of the issues that was raised here at the lecture was the whole I- issue of you know, energy security, um, climate change and all of these things. On the one hand, you've got the big boys like you know, America completely withdrawing from um, all agreements that would um, force them to also contemplate cutting um, here and there so that they can also mitigate climate change. And then on the other hand, you've got countries like South Africa investing in very expensive technologies uh, in order to try and mitigate climate change which seems a little bit unfair especially because we have a whole heap of coal admittedly yes of late uh, we've had a, a situation where there hasn't been the right quality coal being served to our power stations so how do we get the balance right especially uh, when we also hear that India has got a whole heap of coal and it's also considering uh, beginning to you know use that and if that's the case we're going to have even more uh, global warming so I do think that there are three principles that come out under energy security. The first is we have to ask if we've got 48,000 uh, megawatts, why the hell are we having an energy crisis when our needs are only about 36,000? And that is, to, is the question about maintenance and how are we making sure we've got qualified people to manage our power stations and our electricity grid, etc. So that's the first big question. The second is the fairness of our engagements with international partners. We clearly need uh, economic development. Economic development is premised, if you like, on cheap energy supplies, and that in part is going to be uh, about the kinds of, of uh, where the coal is a, is a component of this. If international uh, countries want us to actually go a much more greener development path, then I think there has to be an argument for subsidization from rich countries to poorer countries to enable a more green uh, a more green path to development. And I think that the international community is just stacking that. Places like the United States, etc. And we all lose out at the end, frankly, because if we don't take that seriously, the climate will get uh, worse off. And as it gets worse off, it will impact on all of us. Mm-hmm. Climates do not stop at national boundaries. They cross borders and they impact on all of us. So I think it's in the interest of the rich countries as much as it's in the interest of the poor to start taking the issue of subsidization and support towards the green energy path more seriously. And then third, and perhaps more, as importantly, we've got to think about alternative sources of energy development. Simply because whether we like it or not, there are two things. One is our supply is not as guaranteed. Even with 48,000, we're not we're still having load shedding, so clearly an independent supply would be useful. But second, we do have to make our contribution to a greener world. If we don't do that, then our great-great-grandchildren will suffer. And we have to be seen as looking at our African development 
but we must also see that we are part of a global community. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Professor. We're going to uh, dismiss you now. That was uh, Professor Adam Habib. He's Vice Chancellor at Wits University. And we bring in now uh, Professor Azar Jamin. He's an economist at, Economi- at uh, Econometrics. Thanks very much for joining us, sir. And I just wanted to get a sense from you what you took away from the professor's uh, lecture this evening. I found it very useful. He took us through the history of uh, development and interactions between politics and economics over the past uh, 70 years. And it was basically uh, in the 50s to the 70s, we had governments trying to intervene very actively to try and boost uh, economies through industry, inward industrialization, uh, tariffs and uh, protection, infant uh, uh, protection of businesses, moving then on to a completely different approach in the 80s and early 90s with the Thatcher-Reagan axis of trying to do away with government as much as possible, privatizing, freeing up economies to the hilt. And we've seen a kind of a move back again towards um, more intervention since then. But the realization that at the end of the day, government is necessary to provide public goods, but it can only succeed in intervening if it is efficient, if governance is adhered to, and if it has competent people to run its operations. And uh, we tend to see that in developed economies that has tended to be more prevalent than in developing countries. But it's a lesson very much for South Africa. But then the challenge comes in, Professor, that um, laissez-faire clearly doesn't work all totally on its own when you just leave the markets to do their own thing. Um, But then having an effective state is an important thing. But to what extent should the state get in there? So after the global financial crisis in the mid to late uh, 2000s, um, there was a lot of regulation to ensure that there wasn't any funny business in the financial sector and that consumers didn't get burnt in the end. But then you do hear people in the financial sector to that say that they're now overregulated. So how do you get that balance right? That balance is a very tricky one to pursue. And unfortunately, what we have seen is the combination of regulation and laissez-faire, if you want, and the introduction of governments to try and rescue the situation has led to extremely uh, loose monetary policy around the world that is feeding the uh, flames of inequality because what's happening is the financial sectors around the world are becoming ever more powerful Uh, the man in the street is being left behind and an ever smaller group of people uh, mainly in the financial sector accountants lawyers etc are becoming exceedingly wealthy uh, CEOs uh, yet the ordinary worker is not seeing any benefits and that is a path that is leading towards more populism and ultimately could lead to huge uh, uh, disruptions and uh, upheavals in the world economy. So one of the topics that was raised was populism and nationalism. We're seeing it obviously in the United States with uh, President Donald Trump, uh, Trump's uh, policy of America first. We're seeing Brexit, which is in part motivated by a them and us mentality uh, and other parts of Europe as well, where people feel that, oh, these immigrants are taking our jobs and all the rest of it. In South Africa, we seem to also be having a similar thing. If you listen to radio shows, people will call in and say, all the foreigners are criminals and, you know, they're the ones who are doing bad things in our society and so on and so forth. How does the South African government get the balance right between welcoming foreigners in the country but also at the same time ensuring that South Africans are able to access jobs and services because especially in urbanized areas there is an over um, a burdened um, uh, there's an overburden on um, those services because of the influx of foreigners for example. I think it's a huge challenge for the government to deal with this issue because the ordinary South African who is uneducated uh, is finding it extremely difficult to find a job and then sees these immigrants coming. But a lot of the problem arises from the fact that these immigrants often have certain skills that the locals do not have and have a motivation to be as productive as possible without being too demanding. 
and so they are taking a lot of the jobs of the locals. Uh, how one addresses that is really only through education of the local community to become more productive itself, to be able to compete with these foreigners, and that's not happening. Our educational system has been letting us badly down, uh, down very badly, and uh, contributed towards rising inequality, which in turn is leading to populist tendencies amongst many of the masses. Lastly, Professor, one of the things that Professor Fukuyama did say was that you can't have everything all at once. At the end of the day, any striving towards development is going to take time. What is it that South Africa needs to be working on now, perhaps low-hanging fruit, where we can begin to see change two years from now so that you and I are not having the same conversations going forward? Unfortunately, it goes way beyond two years of work that we need to do, and that actually rests with the educational system and especially t in the world of today where the fourth industrial revolution is starting to take over everything uh, more and more South Africans will be left behind if we don't improve education and the outcomes and an and, uh, and aptitude in mathematics and science the ability the cognitive ability to count to be able to work uh, to solve problems and to be able to read in the first instance in order to understand where, uh, how to solve those problems. Okay, Dr. Azar Jameen, thank you very much for your time, sir. So that was uh, Dr. Azar Jameen. He's a chief economist at uh, Econometrics. And basically, this lecture, uh, its main focus was really on the strength of the state, saying that if you've got an effective state, then it will be instrumental in ensuring that you have growth and development. If you don't have a strong state, a state that is ethical in leadership, you're not going to get the economic growth. You're not going to get the the proper distribution of wealth and so on and so forth. So what we've been experiencing with state capture has been very deleterious for the economy. It's benefited a few. Many people have suffered resources that could have gone towards the development of hospitals, schools, etc., etc., were funneled into a few individuals' pockets. And we need to get away from that culture. People here saying that the rule of, of law must be strictly applied so that no matter who you are, if you commit a crime in the country, you should be brought to book and if you're found guilty slung in jail so hopefully going forward state the state capture inquiry will actually bring about those results if, if wrongdoing is proven to have been done and uh, you know we need the capacity to get the economy going again we're hearing about lots of people emigrating from the country which is very negative and not just black and not just white people black people as well so anyway that's all we have for you here at uh, Witz, uh, uh, school of governance it's back to you Stephen. thank you very much indeed fascinating lecture given there by the historian francis fukuyama very interesting guests there as well